All right, let's open in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time uh, to be together, to hear from your word, to fellowship, to build each other up, to receive your grace and your love through others, and to also uh, serve them with your grace and your love. We pray that uh, you would bless the sermon and that we would um, just be edified. And we thank you for your grace and amen. So today we're continuing our vision called, today we're continuing our seri- sermon series called the GCF Vision. Uh, the vision, or the GCF vision, is a term we use a lot, but we haven't really had a thorough teaching on it since Greg was teaching at RCF at Wright State. And um, GCF's vision is that there are certain aspects of Christianity that God wants Christians to rediscover and restore. Uh, and there's five of them that we're focusing on. Number one, having a biblically complete understanding of, experience of, and presentation of the gospel. Number two, being grace-based instead of performance-based. Number three, being reformed and charismatic. Uh, Number four, understanding the role, relevance, and responsibilities of the church. And number five, having a victorious eschatology. Um, So we are on part four of this series, understanding the role, relevance, and responsibilities of the church. So we're kind of trying to just get a sense of what God teaches about the church overall, even though that's kind of a big goal, we're trying to do it, um, in what Christians should think, feel, and believe about the church. So that's why it's called the role, relevance, and responsibilities of the church. So to, today we're starting the part where we talk about responsibilities. Uh, last week we covered the role and relevance of the church, mostly the relevance of the church because we had somewhat already been talking about the role of the church. Um, but we also kind of ended up covering some of the responsibilities of the church at large when we talked about the role of the church, because the church has three ministries to God, uh, to each other, and to unbelievers. So today we're actually going to talk about the, the responsibilities of church members, and I was going to title this sermon, The Responsibilities of Church Members, but I decided to change it to The Christian's Church Responsibilities, because I wanted to make it totally clear Every Christian, if you're really a Christian, if you're not a false convert, you are a member of the church. So these apply to everyone. It doesn't matter if you haven't decided to choose a church or not. You are a member of the church if you are a Christian. So this is the Christian's church responsibilities. These apply to any and every Christian. Uh, So there's like nine of them. We're only going to cover four of them today. This will be two parts. But these are uh, things the Bible says that every Christian has the responsibility to do. So we're going to start off simple. The first one is attending. Let's look at Hebrews 10, verses 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So in the Bible, we are commanded to not neglect meeting together. God has a people for himself, and the church is that people, and God wants us to meet together, to assemble together, to gather together, to build each other up. And that should be throughout the week, but it should also be on Sundays specifically. The Bible has the assumption in it that believers will gather together on the Lord's Day. Just to kind of prove that that's an underlying assumption in the scriptures, let's look at 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. So Paul says to set something aside for a special offering that the Corinthian church is taking to help the Christians in Galatia, and he says to set something aside on the first day of the week. Why the first day of the week? Why not the second? Why not the third? It's because they're already gathered on the first day of the week. Because the first day of the week is Sunday. So Paul has it as an assumption, you're a Christian, you meet together on Sundays. It's part of Christian culture. It's an underlying assumption in the scriptures. It goes without being said. 
Uh, but anyways, every Christian has the responsibility to attend church. We can't live the Christian, the Christian life can't be lived without other Christians, and God wants us to meet with other Christians on Sundays and throughout the week, building relationships with each other. Every Christian should be regularly assembling with other Christians. But let's get to the next responsibility of the, the nine we're covering overall. Uh, one of the responsibilities that every Christian have is tithing or financially supporting the church. Uh, let's look at some scriptures on that real quick. Leviticus 27, verse 30. Every tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord, or it is set aside for God. Let's look at Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down a blessing until there is no more need, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy your fruits or your soil. And your vine and your field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for your land will be a delight, says the Lord of hosts. And uh, lastly, let's look at Numbers 18, verse 21. To the Levites, I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for the service that they do, their service in the tent of meeting. Let's kind of keep that last one in mind, that one of the purposes of the tithe, um, as mentioned in the law, is that God set aside the tithe for Levites in return for the service that they do. We're kind of going to come back to that. So whether or not tithing is required in the new covenant is somewhat debated among some Christians. Uh, but there's some, good, there's some solid points to consider, even if it might not be one of the most point-blank clearest things. There's some really good points to consider about tithing. Uh, first off, tithing is mentioned before the giving of the law. Let's look at Genesis 14, 12, uh, no, Genesis 14, Verses 18 through 20. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And, he, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything, or a tenth of all the spoils. So Melchizedek is a priest. In some sense, Melchizedek did a service to Abraham in blessing him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of his increase, or of the spoils. Another point worth considering, not just that tithing is mentioned before the law was given at Sinai, but Jesus affirmed that the Pharisees should have been tithing, which they were doing. But let's look at Matthew 23, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So the Pharisees were tithing and they were neglecting other things, but Jesus affirmed it as good that the Pharisees were tithing. He affirmed it as something they ought to have been doing. Another point I want to mention uh, in regards to tithing being something believers should today. Well, let's look at Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. So there are some parts of the Torah, some parts of Old Testament law that no longer apply in the New Covenant because new covenant, they've been fulfilled. 
But I've never heard any Christian make the argument that Proverbs doesn't apply. I've never heard anyone say, I don't need God's wisdom in Proverbs because I'm in the New Covenant. I've never heard anyone say that about any verse in all of Proverbs. And I think all Christians can agree, Proverbs still applies. That being said, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10 still applies. If you honor God with the first fruits of your produce, he will bless it. The fourth point I want to mention is to a good reason to think tithing is for Christians today, is the Bible teaches that we should seek to support those who minister to us. More specifically, the New Testament teaches we should seek to support those who minister to us. Let's look at 1 Timothy 5, verses 17 through 18. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. Now we're going to kind of track back to something Stephen said this morning. Stephen said, biblically, honor isn't just about what's in your heart. It isn't less than that. Honor does have to do with what's in your heart. But if you never show it, it's not real. And it's not just saying here, you know, think of them twice. Think of the elders who rule well twice as good as you think of other elders. That's not what it's saying. It's talking about something more practical, as we'll see in the next verse. It's talking about uh, financial support. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it threads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. So it's clear from the context this is talking about financial support. And the New Testament is very clear that Christians should seek to financially support those who minister to them. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 9, verses 3 through 14. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife as the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and save us? Now, I want to point out, this may seem unrelated to the next part, but it's not. Paul's talking about finances even in this part. Because eating and drinking, unfortunately, costs money. And taking along a believing wife anywhere you go costs more money than going yourself. Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope, and the fresher fresh in hope of sharing the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than uh, put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ." Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. So for for anyone who would think that tithing is one of the things, commands that isn't applicable in the New Covenant, I would encourage you to consider that in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says in the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. And even though this isn't a sermon about tithing, we'll mention one last good reason uh, for why Christians should tithe. 
I would say, moreover, given all the passages about giving in the New Testament, if a believer has an issue with giving 10% of their income, they should question whether or not they're dealing with a heart issue when it comes to giving. If Christ has really changed your heart, you should want to give towards the things he cares about. Let's look at Luke uh, chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. So this is John the Baptist speaking, speaking to the crowds. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what shall we do? So in some sense, since he told them, bear fruit keeping with repentance, they're asking, how can we bear fruit keeping with repentance? How can we have fruit that shows that our repentance is real? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. So John is saying one of the signs of true repentance, one of the signs of a changed heart, is a willingness to give. Let's look at another example of that from Luke, Luke 19, verses 8 through 10. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus acknowledged Zacchaeus' drastic change in disposition towards money as evidence of true repentance, evidence of the gospel changing his heart. Today salvation has come to this house. If a believer has an issue with giving 10% of their income to the work of Christ, they should question whether or not they're dealing with heart issues when it comes to giving. That being said, we should be excited about being able to financially support the work of the church. It's a great blessing. It's something we should feel privileged to be able to do. And I would say there's two big reasons for that. There's probably more, but we only have time to mention two. First off, the expansion of God's kingdom is the most important thing happening in human history. From the beginning of the expansion of God's kingdom till the end of it, it will always be the most important thing happening in human history. And to be able to quicken it, to be able to help it happen quicker and more effectively is the best thing you could do with your life. Because the best thing that could ever happen to you is the culmination of God's kingdom. You will be intensely happier than you've ever been for the rest of ever once God's kingdom is culminate. So the expansion of God's kingdom is the most important thing in human history, and it is a privilege to be able to help it happen quicker or more effectively. Not only that, but I think it's worth mentioning that God will reward us for our giving. Let's look at Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So another thing that's somewhat debated among Christians is, should you give for wanting reward. That's kind of complicated. But Jesus is kind of encouraging it. You have to realize. Jesus is saying, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So biblically, we should give for faith and for love. Giving because we believe that God will bless it, or give us, will reward us in the end, has to do with faith in God. We are trusting him. And we should have faith and love. 
Let's look at Hebrews 11, verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So God wants you to believe that he rewards those who seek him. He wants you to obey him out of faith because that honors him. And he also wants you to obey him out of love because that honors him. Christians should obey out of faith and love. We should seek to serve God and to give out of faith and out of love. They both honor God. They're both important to him. So anyways, all Christians have the responsibility of attending church and tithing, financially supporting the church. Uh, The next responsibility I want to look at is serving. God wants every Christian to serve in the church in some way or another. Let's look at John 13, verses 12 through 15. When Jesus had washed their feet, or when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me a teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Let's also look at Galatians 5, 13 through 14. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use that freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now there's a number of ways serving one another might play out in a local church. It might be in some quote-unquote official way in the church. There's the cooking team. Most churches have some sort of meals together somewhat regularly. We have one each week, and there is a cooking team. There's the cleaning team. There's the sound team. There's ways to serve and worship, and there's helping in children's church. But oh, the way a person ser- use their gifts or their talents to serve the church might be through other ways that are more non-official or more in private. Let's look at, uh, well, the example of Dorcas, we can quickly examine. Let's not read the whole passage. But if you remember Dorcas or Tabitha from Acts 9, uh, She was well-loved by everyone who knew her, everyone in her church, because she made garments for people. That wasn't an official church ministry, but she served those in her church. And there's plenty of ways you can serve in non-official ways that are real, necessary service. Half the people in GCF, when we have car issues, we go to Bradbury. And that is a service. You know... A person might serve others in the church by helping people make it to doctor's appointments or by helping with car issues or by helping people who are going through grief or helping someone learn how to work with a budget. It could be any number of things. But God wants every member of the church, which is every Christian, to serve others in the church. The last thing I want to say about our responsibility to serve in the church is that we should be excited about serving other Christians in the church. Namely, because when we serve other Christians, we are serving Christ. Let's look at Matthew 25, verses 34 through 40. Then the king will say uh, to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. 
Jesus thoroughly loves his church. He thoroughly loves every single member of his church and so identifies with each of us that to the degree someone did something to us, good or bad, he feels as if they did it to him. So that should make us excited to serve other Christians. Because what we do to benefit or to bless or to help other Christians, Christ feels as if we did that to him. That should make us excited about serving others in the church. He doesn't say this about all people. He says, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. This passage does not apply to all people. This passage applies to Christians. Jesus isn't saying, if you did this to a human, you did it to me. He's saying, if you did it to a member of my church, part of my bride, you did it to me. Just like uh, Jesus met Saul on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So we should gladly serve others because it is a way to be a blessing to Christ. It is a way to please him. Mm-hmm. Logan, what time is the pizza going to get here? <laughs> 20 minutes. Okay. All right, I think we have time to include one more part. So this third... Um, no, that was the third. The fourth responsibility I want to talk about today is submission. This one's a fun one. Everybody loves to submit, right? <laughs> but every believer has the responsibility submit to submit to leaders in a local church. The Bible is point blank about it. Let's look at Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So submission to spiritual leaders is a command from God. God wants you to have spiritual leaders in your life. He wants that for every Christian. And he wants us to submit to them. We looked... uh, last week or the week before, at how God designed us to need others in the church. He purposefully designed the church to be interdependent. And one of the ways in which he did that is he he designed us to, so he designed us to need the help of others, and because of that, one of the ways he provides for that need is he gives us leaders in the church, and he wants us to submit to them and to receive the help that they have for us. But I, I want to point something out, because typically in the United States, we're very self-willed, and we feel kind of painful about this whole idea of having other people we have to submit to. But that's not how we should feel about our spiritual leaders. I might feel that way about the government, and maybe I need to change my heart in that. But it, it's even more clear with spiritual leaders, we should not think of it as a bad or painful thing. God gives you spiritual leaders in order to help you. So there's a few things I want to say about that. The fact that God cares enough, that he cares about you enough to make someone else accountable for your spiritual well-being is a testament of his love for you. The fact that God loves you so much that he's willing to make someone else responsible for your well-being is part of his love for you. I want to read Hebrews 13, 17 again in a different translation uh, from the Common English Bible. I like how the CEB words it. Rely on your leaders and defer to them because they watch over your whole being as people who are going to be held responsible for you. You need to be able to do this, or they need to be able to do this with pleasure, not with complaints about you because that wouldn't help you. God loves you enough that he has made other people responsible for you. And your spiritual leaders, you know, because every believer is going to stand before Christ, and we're all looking forward to being told good and faithful servant, but we're going to have to give an account to him for everything we did 
and everything he made us responsible for. And leaders, your leaders are made responsible for you, and that is God's grace. But that's a serious thing. Let's look at James 3.1. My brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers, because we know that teachers will be judged more strictly. He's talking about when Christ judges believers. Um, Now again, no believer will ever be condemned, but we still will have to give an account for God, to God. And your leaders are going to be held responsible for you. That's a reason to appreciate them. But that's also a testament of God's love for you. The other thing I want to point out uh, to help us kind of digest this, that we are supposed to submit to spiritual leaders, is that your leaders are there to help in practical ways. There's five different uh, areas that I have listed Uh, where, you know, your leaders are there to help in practical ways. The first one is accountability. We all need accountability. You know, it it says in Hebrews to encourage one another day after today so that no one be hardened because of the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful. You know, it's so easy to, without even thinking about it, uh, just justify some sin is, well, there's this reason to do this, or it's okay in this situation. Sin tempts you to do that. Sin is deceitful, and we need accountability. Another way our leaders are there to help us is with counsel. Everyone is benefited by having godly counsel. Let's look at Proverbs 11, verse 14. Where there is no guidance, a people falls, but in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. And some translations say in abundance of counselors, there is victory. But really, there's both. Because having an abundance of good counselors leads to wisdom. And wisdom leads to safety and victory. But God gives us leaders so that we can have accountability and so that we can have counsel. And we need both of those things. But another reason God gives us spiritual leaders is so that we can have comfort when we need it. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, So through Christ, we share abundantly in comfort, too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. So elders or spiritual leaders tend to be a bit older in the Lord, which means they tend to have more experience. And part of that experience often includes that God allowed them to suffer more things so that they could become instruments of comforting others who are suffering. So God gives us spiritual leaders for accountability and for counsel, but also for comfort. I I would feel confident that for any of the elders in our church, if you had an emergency and it was 3.30 in the morning and you called them and woke them up, they would be, you know, not upset about it. Because they're there for your comfort. Another thing that leaders are given uh, to us for is for equipping. Let's look at Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12. And Jesus gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So all saints have ministry. All saints have ministry to God. All saints have ministry to each other. And all saints have ministry to the world. And we need to be equipped for that. And God gives leaders for equipping. And that's something we should seek to take advantage of. Another thing I want to point out, um, another reason God gives us spiritual leaders is because of prayer. To have someone 
hopefully especially committed, to pray for us. As believers, we are all responsible to pray for other believers. But part of God giving you leaders is him giving you people who will be especially committed to pray for you. I want to look at 1 Samuel 12, verses 19 through 23. And all the people said to Samuel, so this was when they decided they really wanted a king, even though God told them you shouldn't want a king, don't ask for a king, it's not going to go well. And they're like, we want a king. And they finally realized it was a bad idea. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die, for we have added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. And then I want us to focus on this part. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord... By ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the way that is good and right. So Samuel saw himself as having a special responsibility to pray for the people of Israel, since God made him a spiritual leader over the people of Israel. And that's a great blessing. You know, I I want everyone to get the point. I say it in in sermons that aren't about prayer. Prayer accomplishes a lot. And having someone who is specially committed to pray for you is a huge blessing. I also want to quickly look at James 5, verse 14. It talks about prayer, but it specifically mentions having the elders of a church pray for you. James 5, 14 says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Your leaders are given for your benefit because God loves you. And one of the reasons God gives them to you because he loves you is so that they can be committed to praying for you. So I want us to be able to see biblically that God gives leaders because he loves us. And, uh, And the fact that he gives them and wants us to submit to them is a good thing and we shouldn't see it as painful or annoying. Instead of thinking of it as painful or annoying, we should have an attitude of appreciation for spiritual leaders, even though they are imperfect, because no one's perfect. And we should think of them as resources to help us grow. I want to look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verses uh, 12 through 13. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. And be at peace among yourselves. We should have a high respect for spiritual leaders who labor on our behalf. Because they're God's gift to us. And we should think of them as resources to help us grow. So that's the fourth um, responsibility that every Christian has to the church. Uh, Attending tithing, serving, and submitting to spiritual leaders. And then next week we'll talk about five more. Uh, But in conclusion, I just want to say in conclusion that these are for every Christian. Every Christian is a member of the church, even if they're not a member of a local church. Every Christian is part of Christ's body. So these are for everyone. So let's close in prayer and then we'll have our communion meditation. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you love each of us so much that you gave others whom you'll hold accountable for our well-being. Uh, We thank you that you gave us each other so that we might serve each other and be served by each other. We thank you that you gave us the church to bless us. Uh, We pray that you'd help us to love and respect and honor others in the church, especially our spiritual leaders. And we thank you for your grace and amen. Today's communion meditation is called Don't Trust in Your Good Works. Let's look at Romans 9, verses 30 through 33. What does all this mean? Even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards, they were made right with God. And it was by faith that this took place. 
But the people of Israel, who tried so hard to get right with God by keeping the law, never succeeded. Why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law instead of by trusting in him. They stumbled over the great rock in their path. God warned them of this in the scriptures when he said, I am placing a stone in Jerusalem that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. But anyone anyone who trusts in him, because the rock is Jesus, will never be disgraced. You can't succeed in being good enough for God to accept you. No one can obey God well enough or often enough to be accepted by God based on their obedience, because God is perfect. And we've all sinned, and we all still do sin. The only way to be accepted by God is to have righteousness that gets credited to those who trust in God. Like we looked at in last week's communion meditation, God credits uh, righteousness to those who have trust in him. But if you trust in yourself that you're justified, that you're okay and accepted by God because you're a good person or because you think you're a good person, then you are not righteous before God, and you are not okay with God. No one who keeps trusting that they're right with God because they're a good person is going to be justified in the final judgment. We have to trust in Christ and not in our works. This is a huge theme in the scriptures, and it's super important. So as we trust Christ, that we are justified because of his grace and because of his death on our behalf, let's thankfully praise him as we come to the table.